Back in 2017, I was about six months out of an internship with a local law firm. I was a junior legal assistant as part of a retainer team for a statewide biodiesel business. It wasn't my only assignment, but it was the one I was formally hired for. However, during downtime, I was bounced around various teams all throughout the year. It was early February when the call came. The biodiesel place had a new owner and he wanted to shake things up. Our jobs were safe, but he wanted to make some investments. New manufacturing plants, two in Missouri and one to the west, within reasonable driving range from their warehouses. Only problem was, there were no suitable properties to build on. This could be a multi-million dollar kind of thing, but we didn't have a property to sign off on. That is, until I realized the area they were looking at, my old hometown of Tomscog, Minnesota. I suggested looking into an old property I'd gone by a thousand times on my way to school. It was this massive empty field on the outskirts of the town with nothing but a few run-down houses that could be easily torn down. We knew the place was privately owned, but had no idea of who the proprietor was. My boss was ecstatic. See, the client had been considering calling the whole thing off, but if we could offer them a property, we could probably get a fat bonus check, along with a finder's fee. It'd be enough to take the junior part off my job title. Since I suggested it, I was given time off to get in touch with the owner of the property. There were some initial problems. The original property documents had been damaged in a flood back in 2014, and only part of the archive had been digitized. The document I was looking for might not have been digitized yet, and since no immediate documents were available, I was starting to suspect the worst. The clerk at the municipal office promised they'd get back to me with a name within four to eight weeks, 12 at the most. That wasn't an option. So I packed my bags, handed my cat to my mum, got the fancy maroon BMW company car, and set my sights on familiar roads. It took me two stops for gas and a needlessly complicated detour because of a fallen oak tree. But I made my way to that field just as the sun started to set. After all these years, it was exactly as I remembered. One large empty property, now covered in mud-stained February snow. A run-down barn at the edge of the property and a small one-story log cabin right next door. All roads were overgrown and there were no discernible paths out there. I considered going back in the morning, but I figured I had some time left. Maybe there was this big plaque with the name of the owner out front. If so, I could have it all settled in a day and be on my way home before I even had the time to unpack. It was getting late and the shadows were growing longer, but I was willing to roll those dice. I double-checked my phone, got a flashlight from the trunk and locked my car. The snow was deep enough to reach my knees. My fancy shoes felt like paper. The cold went straight through. Still, I pushed on, beelining straight across the field. I severely overestimated how much time I had left. By the time I got to the cabin, it was already getting dark. Using the flashlight, I took a quick lap around the place just to make sure I wasn't walking into some kind of hillbilly trap room. It didn't take long for me to realize that this place had been abandoned for years. Not only was it boarded up, but the boards used were rotten. The fact that the place was standing at all was nothing short of a miracle. I tried knocking a little just to make sure no one was home, but I wasn't holding my breath. The place was desolate. I looked for some kind of name, or plaque, or hell. Something carved into a wall somewhere. Anything. But there really was nothing. I considered coming back in the morning, but I could see dark clouds on the horizon. And I didn't want to walk through that snow any more times than absolutely necessary. I decided I'd do a little 
urban exploring. After all, if the door was open, it wouldn't hurt to have a peek inside. Walking up to the door, I noticed something strange. There was a carving at the top of the door frame. Word by word, my flashlight revealed the full sentence. No one has ever lived in this house. I tried to wrap my brain around it. It didn't make much sense. What the hell did that even mean? Of course, someone had lived there. Someone built it and someone owned the property. Why would there be a house in the middle of nowhere that no one had ever lived in? I hesitated. Something told me to just walk away and come back in the morning. But the clouds on the horizon and my freezing feet were telling me otherwise. There was a carving. That meant someone had the habit of leaving messages. Chances were there might be more of them inside. Twiddling the handle a little, I noticed the door was unlocked. So in I went. The cabin had a very basic layout. There was one large room with a wooden bench facing a simple fireplace. There were two handmade tables and the westernmost wall was lined with dried herbs, mostly blue and black. There was a surprisingly clean cowskin on the floor, as well as a small door on the easternmost side of the room leading to a kitchen. It was mostly just an antique kind of stove and a couple of cabinets, but whoever had lived there must have been accustomed to a sparse lifestyle. But no, that wasn't it. I had to correct myself. The carving said no one had ever lived there. Then, why the furniture? I decided to ignore the message for the time being, instead focusing on finding the name of whoever owned the place. There might be some initials on the handmade furniture. I gently moved the bench and tables first, going over them with my flashlight. There were no obvious markings, but another problem quickly arose. My flashlight was giving up on me. It started to flicker. Looking around, I could see no other possible source of light but the old fireplace, and I couldn't imagine that thing not being clogged. Then again, there was firewood, and I did have a lighter. I quit smoking about two years prior, but I always kept it around just in case. Breaking off a piece of bark and lighting it, I double-checked to make sure the smoke cleared and went up. Surprisingly, it did. Glancing at my phone, I figured I could use it for a flashlight as well, but I didn't want to drain the battery. Instead, I lit a fire and left the front door open just in case the smoke didn't entirely clear out. Carbon monoxide poisoning's no joke. As the fire sputtered to life, I sat down to take a breather on the bench. It was a pretty cosy little cabin, the kind of place where you'd stay a night or two when going fishing. I could imagine my dad warming his hands by that fire. I lost him in 2010, but that was the kind of place he'd always been most at home in. As I warmed my hands, watching my shadows grow longer, I could imagine him sitting next to me. I could almost hear him. And in that moment, my eyes drifted to a space right in front of the fireplace. A space where a small iron plate protected the floor. I don't know what drove me to look closer, but I realised there were no screws or nails keeping the plate down. So with a quick touch of the fire poker, it came loose, revealing a sort of makeshift metal box. There were four items in total inside. A broken pocket watch, an empty hip flask, three spent shotgun shells, and a small journal. I went straight for the journal, checking for a name. It was getting darker outside, so I huddled around the fire. As snow began to tap against the wooden barricades, I had two choices. To steal this journal, or to read it by the fire as the storm raged on. It was my cold feet that decided for me. I took off my shoes and warmed them by the fire. 
as I started to slowly read my way through the rough cursive text of the old journal. Not the kind of job I'd imagined I'd do at a law firm, but things never quite go the way you've planned. I opened the first page, hoping to find a name. Instead, I was greeted by a strange text, journal written by. Then, nothing. That was it. No name, just that. I turned the book over, back and forth. No name anywhere. I kept reading. The first page reads as follows. I once had name and creed. A couple of truths thrown to the grave long before my end. Now I remain, battered and empty. My history is unusual, as my mind turns sun-bleached and distant. My heart burns of wrath, but I cannot recall as to why. I turned the page. I couldn't help but to be intrigued, if not for any other reason than to find the name of the author. This house is not my property, and to my recollection, no one has ever lived here. He proceeded to discuss at length the part of his history that he did remember. Growing up in Wisconsin, being the son of a shoemaker, little anecdotes of a long life, his first kiss, his first love, his first house. But the further along he tried to remember, the foggier it got. I was starting to think I might never find a name, but I wasn't sure why. At some point, the author recalled something happening. He couldn't explain what or why or where, but he could recall something upsetting his routine. Something came to him, and it made him upset. He spoke about putting up barricades, keeping a loaded shotgun at the ready, and locking himself inside for days on end. It might have been here that I made my stand, he wrote. It could be, it should be, but I can't say that it was. He would go on to detail some sort of struggle, but he couldn't picture what it was against. The text was so strangely written. I could tell there were segments, as if written piece by piece, but it was impossible to tell just how much time had passed between them. Even in the journal, the author lamented on large segments of time randomly missing. I couldn't help but to consider the other items in the box, in particular, the spent shotgun shells. The author proceeded to explain how he'd broken the pocket watch, as it had frustrated him. He was losing track of time. He might think ten minutes had passed, only to realise the entire afternoon was gone. He broke his watch as a reminder that he couldn't trust himself anymore. Maybe I'll remember that, he wrote, or will the watch unbreak itself? I was disrupted from my read by a sudden noise. Looking up, I could see the fire was dying out, but the sound actually came from my phone. Turns out it was my automated time to go to bed alert. I'd been sitting there for six hours. That didn't make sense. I stood up, clutching the journal. There was nothing there. The cabin was empty, but I couldn't escape this sudden sense of dread, like something awful had just happened. But I couldn't say exactly what. Looking down on the journal, I suddenly realised that I felt exactly as described by the author. I felt this unexplainable anxiousness, like that uneasy feeling you get when you feel that someone is watching you, only more palpable. Standing up with my back to the fireplace, I continued reading. He continued to explain how his flask was empty, but that he couldn't remember drinking from it. He detailed his plans to conceal a few items, along with his journal, for an entire day, just to see if he could remember to retrieve it. But not yet, he lamented. There are trespassers to deal with. This was where the spent shells came into play. The author revealed how he'd found a group of strange trespassers. He'd taken them all out with his shotgun. 
He wrote in detail about shooting three times, but that he couldn't remember anything about them. Men, women, or children. There was no way to tell. I buried them by the barn, he detailed. It seemed like the right thing to do. Why am I crying? As the journal neared its end, the author tried to summarize his remaining thoughts. Something came to him, wherever he was. It did something, and as a result, everything was destroyed. He was devastated but couldn't even remember why. It was like muscle memory. Something in his body was remembering the sadness. I inscribe upon this door, he wrote, that no one has ever lived here. I do not recall this place or anyone living here. It serves as a warning and a reminder that this is not my home. And with the final page, the author documented putting it all in a sort of hidden lockbox in front of the fire. He would do so for one day to see if he could remember retrieving it. Evidently, he couldn't. With the final words, on the final page, he gave one last piece of insight. Perhaps in a moment of clarity. It started when I lit the fire, he wrote. Everything turned worse after I lit the fire. Looking back at the fireplace and the sputtering logs, I slowly came to the realization of what kind of situation I'd put myself in. I had accidentally followed the footsteps of a man who used to be in that cabin. A man that might have owned it, but couldn't even remember it. Or, who knows, maybe he was just passing by. I decided to take my chances and just leave. I brought the journal along, opened the door, and prepared to brave the weather. But something happened, right then and there. Something made me stop, and I just stood there. I stood there long enough for my hands to turn blue, and I only snapped out of it when a snowflake hit my eye. I wasn't alone. There was something there, and it was doing something to me. I had rung the damn dinner bell. Thinking about it, it feels a bit like being eaten alive. Not physically, but the same feeling remains. This heedless consumption something taking an intimate part of what makes you yourself and tearing it away. That's what I still remember. That's what it feels like. But it is hard to explain something I can't remember. It feels like a void in your mind. But you have this instinct to fill it with something bad. Like watching a scary movie and knowing something horrifying is about to pop up. Every time I think about it, trying to picture it in my mind, I get that same feeling. Sometimes my mind fills it as a sort of organic darkness, roughly shaped as a person. Other times it's just some guy. It changes whenever I look back at it, because there's nothing there for me to remember, so my mind fills in the blanks. But who's to say that all those blanks are false? I turned around and realized I'd been exposed to this thing. It was doing something to me, and it was bad enough to make me run head first into the dark. Looking back at this, all I really remember feeling was that immense panic. A prey reflex, like trying to escape a wild animal. I ended up in the old barn, where I hid behind a mound of debris next to one of the collapsed walls. My fingers were freezing, but I was going to call for help no matter what. Only problem was, I couldn't remember the code to unlock the phone. I tried, but between my fingers being too cold to register and something unfathomable approaching from just around the corner, I decided it was better to hunker down and be quiet. Because while I can't remember anything about the physical features of it, I remember thinking it wasn't very perceptive for some reason. It passed me by, but I couldn't make any sounds without revealing my position. Calling for help was out of the question. Instead, I turned my attention back to the journal. My lock screen had a bright picture blurred in the background, 
allowing me to use it as a makeshift mini flashlight of sorts. For some reason, I wasn't afraid that the creature would spot me visually. Perhaps it didn't have eyes. I turned the pages back and forth, looking for a particular segment. There was something about the weapon the author had used to deal with the intruders that left me wondering. But I could barely make out anything in that journal. Between my pounding heart, my freezing hands and the strange thing lurking about, I couldn't make heads or tails of the damned cursive text. I can't remember what kind of sounds the creature made, but I can remember the sounds the environment made when it passed. I remember wood splintering as something climbed the walls. I remember creaking wood from a sudden weight coming down. I remember a door splintering as it was torn from its hinges. Finally, I found the page I was looking for. Just after talking about how he didn't know why he was sad about killing the intruders, the author wrote, I threw the damned thing into the hayloft. I have not been able to retrieve it, as the memory of its shape eludes me. How does one recognize a weapon that one has no recollection of ever wielding? I waited for the entity to step outside before I made my way upstairs. It is a strange feeling, trying to balance the instinct to run with the obsessive thought of staying quiet. Every creaking floorboard sent shivers down my spine, curling my toes in anticipation of something running me down. But nothing happened. It didn't take long for me to find it. An old double-barreled hunting rifle. Looking over it, I saw that there was some sort of shell still loaded. Perhaps it'd work, perhaps not. I was no expert, and I didn't have much of a choice but to try. I'd be a sitting duck out there without it. After all, I couldn't remember where I'd parked my car. I decided to go on the offensive. I made my way down the stairs a little too quick, and before long, I heard this scurrying noise as something entered the old barn. I remember standing a good 15 feet away from it and raising the weapon towards it. It stopped, but so did I. For a while, we just sort of circled one another. I remember my movement being in response to a threat. Do you, is this eat or play? I asked. If this is you eating, I bet all those memories disappear after a while. Digested, then you wouldn't remember what this is or what it does. But you do, don't you? I remember tapping the rifle for emphasis. There was a long pause, but I can't remember why. Did it respond? Could it talk? If you're just playing, then you... You might remember that this thing is loaded, I continued and you might know what it does. You saw what happened when he used it. You heard it. A shorter pause. We stopped circling. I gripped the weapon tighter and stepped forward, advancing. If this was a consumer, and it worked in any way like we do, it would absorb and convert what it fed on into some sort of nutrient. But if it was just collecting, for some reason, then it would have this archive of thoughts to recollect from. That was my reasoning. Or maybe it was just clever. Maybe it was just as clever as I was. I made my way back outside. Even in the newly fallen snow, I managed to find what remained of the path I'd made when I first got there. I walked backwards down the path, my rifle steadily aimed at... something. I didn't want to pull the trigger. If it misfired or I missed, I was dead. Just having the means of defending myself was enough to keep it away, for now. I think it had left some sort of toxin in me. Despite not being anywhere near me, I still felt the effects of it. I kept falling into this sort of fugue state, getting turned around and losing grip of where I was going and why. At one point, I was just standing there, gawking at the dark as my rifle thumped to the ground. But there, in the dark, a memory surfaced. 
the same memory I'd felt back at that cabin. Thoughts of my dad taking me fishing. Back then, we'd worn rubber boots, and instead of snow, there was mud. It was still deep, and I had to walk the same way that I did in the snow. Maybe that's what triggered the memory to begin with. I tried to keep that image in my head. The anticipation as we gathered our bait. Learning how to tie a proper knot. Getting the correct measurements for the distance between the hook, the weight and the bobber. I could almost hear the spinning fishing line as the red and white bobber sailed across the lake. Just holding on to something I knew I couldn't forget was all I needed. It became this sort of bedrock, keeping me from completely losing my mind and focus. I could keep going, holding on to something I knew to be true. It was a backstop, keeping me from losing track. I grabbed the rifle and pressed on. As I did, I remember something rustling the nearby trees, retreating into the woods. By the time I made it back to my car, the toxin had completely taken hold of me. At that point, I had little to nothing to hold on to, but for a few cherished memories. I crawled into my car, locked all the doors, and tucked myself into a fetal position in the back seat, still clutching the rifle. My body didn't know how to react. I was hot, cold, wide awake, and deeply unconscious all seemingly at random. I would lose my sense of object permanence, bobbing my head back and forth, completely forgetting what I was doing and what was even happening. At one point, something made the passenger door creak. Maybe someone tried to open it. Luckily, all doors were locked and I had the keys. I remember laying in the back of the car, raising the rifle. Then there was a pause, a long one. Something made me shake my head. It made me angry and afraid, very afraid. It left me with this sense of a rabbit being stared down by a pack of wolves. I had something it wanted, something it deeply valued. Again, this creature is just this sort of nothingness. I can't recall what it looked like or if it was even a physical being. From context, I think it could talk. I think it said something to me that I didn't want to hear. And to this day, when I think of it, my mind just conjures these otherworldly horrors. Teeth, skin, claws. But I didn't lower my rifle. Not for a second. I didn't try my luck, and I didn't challenge fate and by the time the sun rose, it was gone. And with it went the sweats, the confusion, and much of the memory voids. First thing I did was check the shotgun shell. Turns out, it was already spent. That leaves a lot of questions, uncomfortable ones. If that thing was just collecting, it would have known that I couldn't hurt it. If it knew that, Why'd it let me go? Did I trade it something? How would I even know? But if it was just feeding, then... How'd it know to stay away from the rifle? I've managed to put this story together piece by piece. Some of my memories are still a bit touch and go. But this is the most complete retelling I can make. I've tried to fill in as many blanks as I can. But it's hard. I kept the journal. I think I still have it somewhere. I showed it to my boss, but it was a weak comfort. The client eventually ended up choosing another site, leaving us in an awful position. Needless to say, that trip didn't get me promoted. That happened years later. Yeah, I still work there. Same firm. I get the feeling that this thing didn't just make people forget things. It made people be forgotten too. Despite all my efforts, not a single person I've met or talked to can remember anyone ever hearing anything about the people who used to live here. 
Even the cleric at the municipal office kept forgetting I'd even made the request to inquire about the land to begin with. That might have just been laziness though. But I get this feeling that I'm missing something. Even though I've wrapped my head around most of this and most of what happened out there, I often get the feeling that I lost something. In those moments, when everything in the world feels uncertain and half true, I look back at that day with my dad. I listen to the spinning of the fishing line. But here's the thing, Reddit. This is what bothers me. This is what made me want to post, to kind of save this for posterity. Like a journal of my own, hidden by my own fireplace. Lately, I can't remember what my dad's eyes looked like. Am I just forgetting? Or is something forgetting it for me?